Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. In today's special video, we'll be continuing our journey with part 2 of 4 of the Waterworld audiobook novelization. In the previous video in this series, we ended with the Mariner captured by the Atollers and swinging in a cage above the Organo Barge. Enola, from Gregor's laboratory, suggests that he may know how to decipher the tattooed map on her back. So let's now travel back to the Atoll and rejoin Gregor as he approaches the trapped and ill-tempered Mariner. A much smaller windmill was atop Gregor's cap, and via a cable that looped around his sleeve, it powered the glow coil and the lantern he carried before him. He went up the stairs to the metal walkway and paused at the closest point to the dangling cage and its silent seated occupant. The old man fished a magnifying glass from his loose patchy clothing and used the lamp to help get a closer look at the mutated man, specifically at his feet. Ah, yes, Gregor said to himself. They are webbed. Isn't that wonderful? Let's see. Isotropic gills. He beamed at the impassive mutation. Ichthyus sapien. You can breathe in water. But the Ichthyus sapien did not reply. I know you can speak, Gregor said. Helen told me. Please try to understand. I'm only here to help you. The Ichthyus sapien spat on Gregor's face. The old man wiped the spittle away with a sleeve. Don't like humans much, do you? Can't say as I blame you. But are all your kind so foul-tempered? I have no kind, Dick the Sapien said. All fish rot, Gregor said. I'd be shocked if there weren't others. That perked the mutation up. If there aren't any of your kind right now, my boy, Gregor said, there will be, eventually. Give nature a little time to catch up with you. Anyway, I've come to ask, that dirt of yours, where did it come from? Not dry land, by any chance. The creature turned away. Gregor tucked the magnifying glass back in a pocket and found something else. A folded piece of paper. It was a rough replica of the tattoo on Enola's back. Do you know what it means? Gregor asked tremulously. Can you read it? The Ichthyus sapien cast his eyes indifferently toward the paper. The ancients did something terrible, didn't they? Gregor asked. Something terrible that caused all this water hundreds and hundreds of years ago. After a pause, the Ichthyus sapien said, If I tell you, will you open this padlock? Gregor frowned. But I haven't a key. His eyes traveled to the windmill cap. You look pretty resourceful to me. There's a mooring cleat down there. See it? Gregor leaned over the railing. He could see a broken mooring cleat on the wharf walkway. That should be as good as any key. If I do let you out, Gregor whispered, can I trust you? I won't hurt anyone, he said. I'll just answer your questions and leave. Soon Gregor was heading down the stairs to the walkway where he snatched up the cleat when a voice boomed out. Gregor! He dropped the cleat and whirled toward the atoll enforcer. What's your business there? Nothing. Just having a look at your captive. Well, get inside. It'll soon be curfew. Gregor looked beseechingly up at the Ichthyus sapien. I'm sorry, the old man whispered. I'm not a brave man. If you know anything about dry land, I beg of you, tell me now. The Ichthyus sapien turned his back on the inventor. Defeated. The old man dragged himself home. The golden glare of the sunrise had a tinge of blood red in it. As the atoll's sharp angles and harsh surfaces achieved an unusual beauty, the individual studying this landscape did so from a considerable distance, through the twin telescopes of an ancient device called binoculars. He was a striking-looking man. Though he wasn't tall, his bearing was enormous. His apparel, tattered as it was, seemed vaguely official, even military. Time for breakfast, boys, 
he said to the barbarian-like smokers around him, who hung on his every demented word. His name was the deacon. He thought of himself as a warrior prince. The deacon preached of a day when men would walk on land again, as they were meant to. Dry land was no myth. It was out there. He would find it. If it took killing every living soul in Waterworld. The child was at a window. What will they do to him? she asked. Out the window, the procession of elders was approaching the dangling cage. You shouldn't watch this, Helen said, tugging the child gently away. But the child would not budge. They're going to bury him, aren't they? Don't watch. Not watching won't make it not happen, Enola said. Then she turned and fastened her eyes on Helen's face. We should help him, she said. The mariner stood facing the tribunal who stood along the walkway. After considerable deliberation of the evidence, Priam said, We have come to our decision. Nice of you to let me know how my trial came out, the mariner said. Sorry I couldn't be there. Priam raised his head, ignoring the prisoner. This, Muto, does indeed constitute a threat to Oasis and to Waterworld itself. Therefore, in the best interest of public safety, and the greater good he is hereby sentenced to be recycled. There were murmurs of assent from the crowd. Proceed, Priam said, in the customary fashion. The mariner heard the grinding of gears and felt his one-cell prison shifting and swaying. Above him, a boom was carrying him over the organo barge. Bones to berries, veins to vines, Priam intoned. These tendons to trees, this blood to brine. Dropping him cage and all into the foul compost stew of theirs. Too strange for life he was, Priam said. This muto does now leave us. The ooze was coming through the iron bars. He was climbing the sides of the cage, but there just wasn't room to go anywhere. Recycled and entombed, Priam went on. In a watchtower through a viewing scope, a watchman kept watch. Something was visible, tendrils of smoke curled skyward, seeming to rise from the water. Smokers! the watchman screamed. The slime was up to his ankles now, and the mariner, his mind on other things, didn't make out the word the watchman screamed. But everyone else in Oasis did. The mariner was a problem instantly forgotten. Forgotten by all but the organo heap itself, which was sucking the cage and its occupant slowly down to the graveyard of sludge. Out on the ocean, closing in on the floating city, was the deacon's armada of smokers. A beat-up seaplane, the armada scout plane, led the way for hovercraft, swamp skiffs, speedboats, and jet skis. The vehicles bore down on the atoll. Within the floating city, the denizens were taking battle stations. The embattlements with water cannon were manned almost instantly. Elsewhere, storm shutters were dropped, fire buckets doled out, and nets of living weapons were reeled in. Jellyfish for catapulting. A horrified cry from the watchtower cut above the din. Berserkers! A chill coursed through Helena as she went to the armory for a weapon. She found a spear gun and a quiver of ammo for it, and followed Enola, who was scurrying up a walkway with her bow and arrows to a wall to defend. Berserkers, Helen thought, scurrying into position. There they were, out on the sun-whitened water, huge, mostly bare brutes on water skis who shot off moving ramps in order to catapult themselves into the air, Simpleton soaring blindly over the walls of the atoll, where they would land inside, anywhere inside. Berserkers hit walkways and walls, and when they survived, instantly infiltrated the fortress oasis had become. Helen fired her spear gun with deadly accuracy, turning their soaring entrances into exits. The cage had stopped sinking. That was the good news. The bad news was all around him carnage and battle reigned, and the mariner could neither protect himself nor anyone else. He was a stationary target here, and it would only be a matter of time before... A smoker stood before him, pointing a handgun. Well, the mariner thought, I don't have far to go to the graveyard.
then the berserker shuddered, flopping on his face on the walkway, a spear sticking out of his back. Standing a few yards behind him was the atoll enforcer. The man looked at the mariner, who yelled, Let me out of here! I can fight! But the enforcer moved on. A screaming berserker on skis came crash-landing into the mariner's cage. The impact killed the berserker at once, but knocked him into the cage, pushing it deeper into the organo pit. And now the cage was sinking again. The muck climbed to his waist so fast he could barely fathom it. The mariner reached a hand out through the bars and tugged a knife off the belt of the dead berserker. He began working on the padlock. Helen and the child remained at the battle station. A barrage from behind chewed up the wall next to her and shredded the atollers fighting there. Helen wheeled around, blocking the child and faced a dripping wet berserker, but soon her spear was in his heart. Helen! Gregor's voice called across the engine noise, the gunfire, shouts, the screams. Helen, it's time! She yanked Enola by the hand, but the child took a moment to pick up a draw stick she had dropped, and then they ran, dodging bodies, skirting skirmishes, heading for the windmills. The mariner was to his neck in shit and ooze, but he had the knife's blade in that lock. It was under the surface of the slime, but he was working it in there. If he could only... And then the blade snapped. On the outskirts of the battle, the deacon inhaled his unfiltered smoke stick. Jet skis and small attack boats were scurrying back to the refueling barges Goju's berth at the bow. The deacon was frankly irritated that his casualty rate was so high, going up against primitive atollers who apparently had no firepower whatsoever. Bows and arrows, spears and lances. How embarrassing. He motioned a flag boy over. Key to the city. The boy nodded and went to the edge of the deck and began working the signal flags, flapping the words to the deacon's favorite toy. The Hellfire gunboat was a barge onto which the deacon had bolted the remains of an ancient vehicle called a truck. The word Mac was on its prow. And on the truck's flatbed, manned by the deacon's best gunner, was an elephantine machine gun that had a cluster of rotating barrels that discharged 20 millimeter rounds successively as they rotated around an axis. The deacon cackled with glee as the rounds ripped through walls, turning in battlements to flying fragments. Well, that was better. Now, if only the prize he was seeking turned out to be within those crumbling atoll walls. Helen and Enola dived for cover as the top of the windmill exploded under a hailstorm of gunfire. Hope and fear fought for control as Helen, her heart pounding, clutched Enola's hand and wove along the wharf walkway through the hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. But when they entered the windmill workshop, the putt-putting sound of the engine told Helen the terrible truth. They were too late. Gregor was leaving without them. She looked up and saw him rising like an apparition. The quilt work bag filled with hot air, the contraption, according to Gregor. It was a small dirigible, a steerable balloon, already six feet off the ground. Gregor, wait! I waited as long as I could, the old man cried. A blast unmoored me. You can still make it, he called. But he was already too far above them. The deacon was the first to spot the cigar-shaped flying balloon. What is that thing? Blast it out of the sky. The flag boy flapped his flag, signaling the gunboat driver, and soon the gunner had wheeled his immense weapon around, powerful arms swinging it up to take aim, squeezing the trigger on a perfect line of fire. That was entered by a leaping smoker on skis with a bladder backpack of go juice that detonated in a fireball. By the time the cloud cleared, the balloon contraption was well out of range. Helen, from a window in the windmill, witnessed the late smoker's fiery landing, but her mind was a whirl, and it took Enola pointing out a window at the stranger in the cage all but sunk down under the ooze to jog her back to life. Gregor was gone, and with him, hope of finding, of reaching, dry land. But someone else knew of dry land, and that someone else might just be capable of getting her and the child out of here. Helen grabbed Enola's hand. We're not through yet the woman said defiantly, and they ran from the windmill. Foul-smelling, sticky death was oozing in all around him. But a man, or whatever he was, does not expect to die drowning in shit, so he didn't give up. He kept his face pushed up to the top of the cage, where there was still air, where he saw a lovely face. 
the tavern keeper. She had laid a hunk of plastic board across the organo pit and was crouched there. If I get you out of here, she said, will you take us with you? If I get the boat, he said, can you get the gate open? She nodded. Then he took something from alongside her, a crowbar. It was in his hands just as the muck swallowed him, and his cage entirely. A blurb of sludge signaled the disappearance of the cage and the stranger within, as the pool of muck swallowed them both. Helen gasped, but Enola said, Look! A gooey brown arm emerged along one solid edge of the organo pit. The stranger, looking more monster than man, pulled himself up onto his feet. His eyes took in the raging battle, the atoll gate shrouded in water cannon mist. Several smokers scurrying about the deck of his trimaran, scouring it for plunder. He looked toward Helen, who was already moving away from the organo pit, Enola in tow. The gates, he reminded her, they'll both have to open or my ship won't make it through. I understand, Helen said. Then he dove off the barge into the lagoon. Helen held Enola's hand as they traversed the walkways toward the gate. Smokers were storming through a breach in one atoll wall, and a hand-to-hand -hand fighting was breaking out everywhere. The atoll was tragically outnumbered. From the walkway, Helen could see the children being shackled for slaver barter, hydro being pumped into smoker containers. She saw something else, an all-too-familiar face. The Nord. So he had been the smoker spy. The elders had consigned the wrong stranger to the Organo Cemetery. She paused as she saw Prime standing along his fallen brethren, wounded, dazed. His angry cry rang across the water. All is lost! Helen shuddered, turning away as the smoker's weapon turned its firepower upon the old man, validating his final prophecy. The Nord strode into the trading post, as around him smokers trashed and pillaged the place. Is this her? a voice called. He turned to see one of his smoker lieutenants dragging in a fair-haired little girl with traumatized eyes. No, you idiot, he said. You heard the deacon's briefing. The one we're looking for is dark, with markings on her back. She's here somewhere. Keep looking. Yes, sir, the smoker said. The mariner, cleansed by his plunge, swam deep, cutting a path toward the trimaran. Soon, bursting from the water, he landed on the stern of his ship, almost at the feet of a looting smoker who swung a spear gun up to shoot. Quicker than an eye blink, the mariner knocked him cold, plucking the spear gun from now limp hands. He snatched a blade from the smoker's belt and nudged the bastard overboard. Then at his steering console, he threw levers, starting the egg beater sail turning. He had the trimaran on course now. Where was that woman? Then he saw her, nearing the twin gatesman towers, the child trailing along. Look, Enola said. Below in the lagoon, on course for the closed gates, was the stranger's trawler. Only the trawler had turned itself into a sleek sailboat. Wow, Enola said. Looking past the transforming trimaran, Helen could see smokers swarming through a breached wall, casually slaying various atollers who had fallen to their knees, praying to the smoke-streaked sky. More practical atollers were diving into the lagoon's waters, some in canoes, others in barrels, some swimming along in life buoys. They needed the gates open, too. It was up to her if any of them were to survive. But at the entry of the gate tower, the bearded gatesman, damp with blood, staggeringly guarded his post. Zed, she said softly. The enemy's already inside. See for yourself. Weaving, he said, If you or anybody tries to open these gates, so help me, Helen, I'll drop you where you... Then a burst of stray gunfire caught him, and he toppled from the gate tower bridge. She bent down to whisper to Enola. When I throw the lever and the gate begins to open, we have to run. She pointed the narrow catwalk attached to the back of the gates. Right now, the walkway was one continuous bridge. But when the gate parted, the walkway would split in two as well. And we'll have to jump. Understand? The child nodded. Helen took a deep breath, then went inside the gate tower and shoved the lever and gears ground as the first gate began to rumble its way open. Let's go, she yelled, grabbing the girl's hand and leaning her down the narrow, moving catwalk. The gate slowly began to open. 
but the mariner knew he could not find passage until the other side swung open as well. Watching the woman and child scurry across the moving walkway, he guided his ship, bullets pinging the water and clanging off metal on the trimaran. Hurry! he called up to the woman and child. They jumped, but as they did, random gunfire hit a go-juice tank, exploding in a mini fireball that rocked the gate, knocking Helen and Enola off balance, sending them toppling off the walkway. As the smoke cleared, the mariner could see that the bottom half of the gate had been blasted apart. Not big enough to sail through, but he cruised toward it anyway, letting his mast bump to a halt against the upper remaining section. Then he clambered up the mast and leapt onto the catwalk. Thank heaven, Helen gasped the child dangling around her neck like a human necklace. But he jumped over where Helen's fingertips clung to the edge of the catwalk and ran along the walkway to the open gate tower. He found the lever and the gate began to swing rumblingly open. As he ran down the moving rampway toward the woman, her expression was one of relief until he leapt over her and threw himself at the trimaran mast sliding down the pole onto the ship. You bastard, the woman screamed. He was already at the helm guiding his ship into the rain of water cannon mist. The sail whumped as the woman-child clinging to her dropped herself from the catwalk onto the full passing sail of the trimaran, and she and Enola came sliding down, landing on the netting deck. She glared at him, about to say something, till he brushed past her to get to the potted tomato plant bobbling in the water amidst various floating rubble. He fished it from the water and returned to his helm, steering the boat out to the open sea, but he was not pleased to see another craft before him a sprawling, smoker-populated barge where jet skis and small boats were refueling. On the deck of the refueler, the deacon growled, What craft is that? A three-hulled sailboat was crossing in view. Signal the hellfire gunboat. Tell them to blow that sailboat to shit and gone, the deacon said. The gunboat started to turn. Steer for me, the mariner told Helen. Why should I trust you? she asked him. He just looked at her, then grabbed a line and swung out to the bow harpoon station. Drawing a careful bead on the Hellfire gunboat, he fired. The harpoon caught the gunboat in the bow, and the harpoon line drew taut. The trimaran had a catch. Soon the mariner's boat was towing the gunboat, pulling it around, the still bullet and fire belching machine gun carelessly shooting up the ocean to where the refueler would be its next, if unintended, target. The hurricane of gunfire was swinging closer and closer to the refueler. The geometry of it was inevitable. While his smoker stood there stupidly, the deacon had the foresight to jump off deck, though his jump was accelerated somewhat when, as the Hellfire gunboat Hellfire tore into the refueler's bow, the barge detonated like a floating bomb it was, disappearing in a startling fireball that scorched the deacon's departing ass. On the trimaran, the mariner used a smoker knife to cut the harpoon line, then returned to the helm and sailed through the rain of the fiery debris and fog of smoke. A lonely, battered tugboat dragged the remnants of a once proud smoker armada. These were damaged craft in some cases. Go juiceless in others, the refueler barge having exploded. Clinging to these craft were smokers as battered as the tug, many of them wounded. Whole sections of the Oasis Atoll were gone. The deacon stepped off the patrol boat onto a stable section of dock. The warrior priest of smokers looked as battered as his men. His head was wrapped in a blood-soaked bandage that rode his bald skull like an off-kilter bandana covering what had been left of his left eye. In the remains of what seemed to be a factory of some kind, the Nord improved the deacon's mood with a discovery. I found this. The Nord sneered a smile as he held out a jar with netting. It was among the effects of the Atoll Elders. The deacon eagerly opened the lid, dug his hand down in the earth. How rich it felt. About a third of the dirt was gone, probably wasted in ceremonial use by these primitives. We're getting warmer, the deacon said. And the girl? The Nord shook his head. Not here. She may have gotten away. The deacon swung a fist at the air. She's what we came for. We didn't lose machines and go-juice and men so we could sack a poverty-stricken garbage heap. A couple of heartbeats inside, the Nord offered. Not saying much. Take me to them. I'll question them personally. 
their wrists lashed to a large gearbox. Two atollers, one of them an elder, the other a gatesman, were slumped, barely conscious. Both were smudged and bleeding, their apparel in shreds. The deacon stood in front of the two prisoners and raised a handgun to the nearest temple of either man. Their eyes widened and both men began to beg for mercy, the words a frantic jumble. If you both talk at the same time, the deacon said, I'll shoot one of you. They fell silent. Good, the deacon said. I need to know about the tattooed girl. Two men began talking again, blabbering all at once, each trying to talk louder than the other. The deacon flipped a metal coin, then blew the gatesman's brains out. The smokers around him didn't flinch. All right, the deacon said. You won. You can talk. I saw the girl, the elder said. She got on a boat with Helen. What boat? The three-hold one. Rage turned the deacon's face crimson. That was the boat that blew up his refueler. That boat had cost him a thousand G's of goat juice. Whose boat? The Muto's, the elder said. The deacon's frown turned puzzled. Muto? What the hell sort of a word was that? He's got slits behind his neck like, like fish gills. He wasn't really a man, a, a fluke of evolution, old Gregor called him. The deacon put the gun back against the elder's head, cocking the hammer back. But you said you wouldn't kill me, the elder said. The deacon backed away, uncocked the gun. You know, I may have. And a man is only as good as his word. The elder gasped in relief. Provider be praised. Provider be praised the warrior priest said, and handed the gun to the Nord and walked away as a second gunshot thundered. When the Nord caught up with him, gun smoking, the deacon said, When we get to the D's, tank up my skyboat. Get it out on patrol. I want that icky freak. Find him, and we'll find the girl. The mariner dove from the ship into the icy waters and swam under the main hull to plug up a hole blown there in the battle. Soon he was flopping back onto the trimaran deck. He reached for his plastic bottle of murky, three-quarter grade water and swigged once. He turned his gaze on the woman, Helen. She had had the opportunity to pilfer a drink from the plastic water bottle while he was down plugging that hole. But she hadn't taken that opportunity, either out of fear or trying to show him she could be trusted. Not that he gave a damn either way. I know what you're thinking, she said glumly. He said nothing. You're thinking how much longer that hydro of yours would last if there weren't three of us on this boat. Well, she said in a reasonable tone, I won't drink at all. Not till we get there. He frowned. Get where? Wherever you're going. And where would that be? Wherever you got your dirt. Dry land. You know where it is. Almost amused, he moved next to her. Yeah. Sure. I know where it is. Her eyes exploded with surprise. I knew it, she said. And we... We're going there. You and I are, the mariner said. The kid we gotta heave over the side. Now her expression fell, horrified. What? He nodded toward the main hull. We're taking on water. My boat got tore up in that fracas. My desalinator got bunged up. We'll be lucky to get half a hydro ration out of that. Her eyes were tight. I said I wouldn't drink for twelve days. I don't think so. She moved away from him with a shudder. Maybe the atollers were right. Maybe you are a monster. He whispered, Better one of you dies now than both die slowly. You're strong. You have a chance. That kid is doomed. Face it. Live with it. He got to his feet, and she reached out and grabbed his ankle. Wait! We saved your life. Without us, you wouldn't have gotten out of there. 
You got me out, he said. So you could get out. That makes us even. But she's just a child. Her face lost all expression. Is there something I can barter then? Like what? She wet those lips. You said yourself you've been out a long time. She was a vision, her shape so womanly and yet girlish. The thoughts must have shown in her face. She called out to the girl, Enola, go below deck. I need to speak to our host privately. Yes, Helen. And then the woman was standing before him, tugging her tunic off. Enola jumped down inside the cabin. Like any kid, she couldn't resist exploring. Almost immediately, she touched a latch to send a board slamming. Jumping back, she cocked an ear, expecting the sound to attract the grown-up's attention and get her a scolding. But they must have been busy up there because no scolding came. On the piece of wood was pinned a homemade chart, and more charts were rolled up there. Paper. Precious paper. And in one of the cubby holes, she found a box. She could not read the words on it. Crayola crayons. Sixty-four colors. But she knew at once what the objects were made for. She snatched a crayon and made a test line on one of the ancient pieces of paper, turning it over to a blank side first. She didn't want to spoil the drawing someone else had made, and she hunkered down over the paper, images spilling out of her mind. She never had color draw sticks before. Helen stepped out of her tunic. She obviously didn't like having to offer herself like this. But once that decision had been made, she went with it. And he certainly admired the looks of the woman. Without his consciously willing it, his hand reached out and touched one lovely round breast. He felt himself stirring and withdrew his hand. No, he said. She was astounded. No. It wouldn't be right. I'm not your kind. And he brushed by her and headed for the stern. He heard her gathering up her clothing behind him. Then he began working the sails. Her voice came from behind him and there was a new edge in it. You're taking us to dry land, both of us. He turned slowly and looked up at her. She was back in her tunic again, but in one hand was a small, one-shot spear gun aimed directly at his heart. Killing's a hard thing to do well, he told her, still working on the sails. How long do you plan to hold that thing on me? As long as it takes, she said unflinchingly. From here to dry land, if... He flicked a pawl holding the jib halyard, and suddenly the sail billowed aft, smothering the woman in its canvas blanket. He grabbed a boat oar and thumped the lump in the sail's middle, her head. The lump slumped. Then in one easy motion he reached under the canvas, fished out her lifeless arm, and yanked the wrist spear gun from her hand. Now maybe he could concentrate on sailing and make a little time before those smokers came looking for them. The Deacon's Castle, the D's, was a sprawling cargo ship that in ancient times had been called a super tanker. Three hundred tons of rust-pitted, barnacle-encrusted steel. A towering smokestack at the stern billowed black fumes, but the ship seemed almost stationary. It had been adrift for centuries, and at this stage of its existence was more atoll than vehicle. Deep in the bowels of the Dees, in the ship's infirmary, Doc, the deacon's personal physician, was tending his patient. The small, emaciated Doc did not look well, his sickly appearance accentuated by tubes permanently installed up his nostrils. The tubes extended to gas tanks on a wheeled cart, which provided the addicted Doc with a recreational mix of various gases. The deacon sat in a lean-back chair. Among the onlookers was the Nord as well as a handful of filthy, feral children. Into a metal tray, containing various antiquated medical instruments as well as a number of ball bearings, the Doc deposited the final tool of the operation, a fine-tipped paintbrush. There, the Doc said. All done. Good as new. Better. The deacon pulled down a mirror and had a look at his new eye. The ball bearing that rode his left socket had a pupil and iris painted on it. The deacon climbed out of the chair, struggling to get his balance. 
The doc studied him. There may be some small problem in depth's perception, but you'll soon adjust. Just as the deacon was weighing whether or not to turn up those valves and overdose the doc in payment for his services, a voice from behind him caught his attention. Excuse me, deacon. A smoker everyone referred to as the ledger carrying the big black balance book he had been named for stood framed in the doorway. There's a problem in the pit. Maybe you should come. The deacon flashed out a pair of swimmer goggles from a pocket. He tugged the goggles on, the black lens covering his bad eye. Let's drive, the deacon told the ledger. The deacon mobile was cobbled together from six different land yachts, rusted out, rolling on the now misshapen rims of its tireless wheels. He climbed into the right front seat. The pit, the deacon said to his smoker chauffeur. Smokers appeared from somewhere to line up behind the deacon mobile and push. The chauffeur popped the clutch and the vehicle lurched into life, spewing exhaust. The deacon mobile pulled up by the door to the storeroom. The deacon waited while the ledger unlocked the heavy steel door. Then he, the ledger, and the Nord went in. Stacked against the walls on the shelves were spoils of countless smoker raids, diminishing cases of prehistoric canned meat, smoke sticks, and beer, canned and bottled. The deacon knew that with the atolls disappearing, the opportunities to replenish this thinning repository were getting fewer and far between. Their footsteps must have indicated their presence to the tenant below because a desperate voice came echoing up through the floor. Somebody! Anybody! Hey, up there! The deacon knelt over the steel cover plate in the middle of the floor and screwed the spigot-like valve, swinging the plate up so he could look down into the blackness of the home of the smoker with, hands down, the worst job on the D's. Yes, the deacon said. Your deaconship! Hello! The lonely smoker called. Twenty feet down, floating on a dingy dinghy in a pool of black sludge, the deacon's human depth gauge was waving his hands. What is it? I thought you should know. We're down exactly to four feet nine inches of black stuff, the depth gauge hollered up. The deacon moved away from the opening. How many G's is that, after refining? The ledger did some quick calculating. Maybe three refueler loads. Is that all? the Nord said. We'll burn through that in two lunars. It doesn't matter, the deacon said. The only thing that matters is the tattooed girl. Don't spare any go juice finding her. Just don't waste it on anything else. The Nord nodded. The deacon placed his left hand on the shoulder of his right hand man. My friend, Dryland is the mother load. The first person who gets there is King. Got it? Not captain of some dying ship. King! Next stop for the Deacon Mobile was the theater, where he rewarded his loyal smokers with screenings of half a dozen films, Land Day artifacts. He stood overlooking hundreds of his men as they sat in the darkness watching the scratchy images of a war film starring John Wayne. Soon the projector bulb died. The smoker army turned en masse to their leader. Let me hear a witness, the deacon's voice boomed. Are we going to dry land or not? The crowd erupted, hooting and hollering at support. The deacon's voice cried, What will we do when we get there? Plow it and paint it. Pile it and pave it. Mine it and depine it, the deacon added, his fist threatening the air. Cheers rose from the smokers. But none of that happens until we find the fishman that has the little girl. Right? The word right returned to him in overlapping unison. Finding her is job number one, and the first guy that spots him gets this. And from a pocket he withdrew a videotape. Operation Desert Storm, the deacon said seductively. The crowd roared and stampeded out of the theater to volunteer for duty. The trimaran was ship-shaped now, or as close to it as could be expected. The mariner shifted his attention to repairing his hydro-recycler. Despite an undercurrent of hostility, the woman was doing her best not to cross him. 
She'd lend a hand whenever she could, working hard, obviously trying to earn her keep, and the child's. He took a seat at the console and plucked his telescope from its scabbard, and began slowly scanning the horizon. Then something was blocking his sights, and he lowered his device and realized Enola had wandered into his line of vision. For the love of Poseidon, he swore. You're in my view. Enola, the woman called, get over here. As the child scurried away, he noticed something clutched in her hand. One of his crayons. Had she been in his things? He turned to complain to the woman. But before the words came out, he noticed something else. Drawings. Right on the hull. Violent images sketched with crayon. Smokers pierced by arrows, atollers wounded in battle. Hey, he yelled. What the hell are you doing? Decorating your boat? It's ugly. He picked her up and set her aside roughly, snatching the Crayola from her hand. He found a cloth and knelt and rubbed at the drawings, but they didn't come off. He shook a scolding finger at the child. You don't touch anything of mine. I drew it for you. You don't draw on anything of mine. Understand? This is my boat. I keep it the way I like it. If I wanted pictures drawn on my things, I'd draw them myself. He snarled at the child. He heard the woman's warning to the child. Stay away from him. But not five minutes later, there the child was, staring unblinkingly at him. You know what? The child asked. He didn't answer. You're not so tough, she said. He didn't look at her. How many men have you killed? She asked. He didn't answer. Ten? He didn't answer. Twenty? You know what? He asked. She didn't answer. You talk too much. And he heaved the child over the side. The splash summoned the woman who looked over the side at the girl thrashing in the sea and yelled, You bastard, she can't swim! And then the woman dove in after the child. Crabs of hell, he thought. Two of them in the drink now. The woman swam well enough. She had the child in tow, and he had to admire her spirit jumping in like that without a thought for her own safety. A pop caught his attention. He had meant to help the woman back into the boat, but then she was boosting Enola up onto the pontoon and swinging herself up there, hopping mad. You son of a bitch! He wasn't looking at her. He was looking at the horizon. I swear, she was saying, if you ever touch that child again, you'll never wake up. As she trailed off, she clearly sensed that he was on the alert. There was a droning sound. Smokers? Helen asked. He turned his attention to the sky. A battered seaplane loped into view and then looped in and began circling the trimaran. Can we outrun him? she asked. Not with my sails down, the mariner said. They may not open fire, they're just scouting us. Are they smokers? I don't know. The plane circled and swooped down, with the goggled tail gunner aiming a grotesque-looking machine gun their way. And then it barked at them, bullets stitching their way across the water and nibbling at the outboard pontoon. The three of them ran for the main hull, heading for the recess of the main cabin. The roar of the seaplane told them the plane was coming around for another try at them. The child ducked behind the mast, the woman right behind her. He quickly ran toward the rear of the ship, diving down the stern hatch. He could hear the woman's voice shout over the seaplane's rumble. Hey! It was an accusation of cowardice. Not that he gave a damn. He was down snatching a double-barrel spear gun off the bulkhead. He whipped out the knife, sliced the line connecting spears and gun, and leapt back up under the hull. The machine gun was silent, though the plane was swooping in for the kill. The mariner caught the frantic face of the gunner, ramrodding the clogged barrel of the jammed weapon. This might buy them a little time. But just as he was thinking how to best use it, he saw the woman hunched over the harpoon gun mounted on the bow, taking aim on the circling plane. He screamed, No! She didn't hear him, or didn't care about his opinion because she fired the gun, and its big harpoon streaked into the sky and stabbed through the plane's fuselage. The mariner almost had to admire her aim. She hadn't just got the plane, she skewered the gunner as well. 
The pilot was looking back frantically at his dead gunner and at his wounded plane. Only the plane wasn't just wounded. It was harpooned like an airborne whale, attached to the trimaran by an uncompromising umbilical cord. As the plane flew, the line connecting to the harpoon gun began to tighten until finally the line went taut, and the expression on the woman's face was one of dawning horror as she realized what she had done. Knife in hand, the mariner ran toward the bow even as the ship lurched with the plane fighting the restraining line. The entire harpoon gun and its stand ripped free of the deck and went flying over his head. The harpoon gun and stand rode its line upward, shredding and tearing sails and lines as it went only to lodge in the spreaders, caught there. The line was wrapped around the mast. He gave the woman a murderous look and ran to the base of the mast. The double barrel spear gun was on a strap, so he tossed it around his shoulder, stuck his knife in his teeth and began climbing the teetering pole. The higher he got, the more nauseating the sway of the mast was as the plane yanked the boat from side to side. The winding line was making a mess of the mainsail, but he was nearing the spreaders where he could get at that vibrating harpoon line and cut the trimaran free. A bullet tore through the sail next to him. He grabbed a line, swung out from the mast, and yanked his spear gun off his shoulder. Drawing a bead on the plane, he sent a spear winging toward the son of a bitch. He could hear its thunk, which meant he had probably hit the plane. The guy would be distracted long enough for the mariner to swing out and cut the shuddering harpoon line. Four pistol shots stitched across the sail next to him. As he ducked the bullets, the knife slipped away from his hand and went tumbling to the deck. He still had one spear in the spear gun. He could see the pilot leaning out, pistol in hand. The mariner took aim, but the pilot shot first, only the shot wasn't aimed at the mariner, rather the harpoon rope that bound the plane to boat. The smoker plane now lurched free and the remains of the rope fluttered after it. The recoiling mass tossed the mariner backward through the tattered trimaran sails and finally dropped him in the water. He was underwater when the harpoon gun stand crashed through the deck. He swam quickly to the boat and hauled himself aboard. His ship looked like hell. I'm sorry, the woman said. I was just trying to... His look silenced her. The deacon's spacious quarters on the D's had once been a conference room. The size of the room lent itself to his putting range, and wearing sunglasses he bent over his putter, lining up a shot. The damn ball-bearing eyeball fell out and clicked against the sunglass lens. Damn it, he muttered, sliding a hand under the sunglasses to push the prosthetic in place. He then expertly putted the ball into the cup. Nicely done, the Nord said. He had been patiently waiting. You said to bring the pilot when he returned. He spotted them. There was a skirmish. Bring him in. The deacon placed a paternal hand on the pilot's shoulder. Tell me what happened. They... They killed Ed. Tragic. Did the fish man have the tattooed girl? The pilot nodded. Yeah, and some atoll bitch. She's the one that shot Ed, harpooned him. There are some bad people in water world, the deacon allowed. But we both know there's plenty more where Ed came from. Now, which way were the heading? The Nord answered the question. West, southwest. End of side two. And so there you have it. That is part two of the Waterworld audiobook. We began with Gregor investigating and interrogating the Mariner and ended with the Deacon questioning the smoker pilot about the location of the Mariner's trimaran. Join me in part three where the story continues. But before you go, remember to give this video a like and subscribe to the channel to continue along with the rest of the audiobook series. Also, follow the Atoll on Instagram for more Waterworld content, link in the description below. And so with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at the Atoll.